What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Just wanted to remind you guys that if you're enjoying these daily videos, especially the longer ones, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you end up enjoying the video. If you have any thoughts about the stories in the video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below, as my favorite part of making these videos is hearing your guys' thoughts on the stories. Without further ado, I will let you guys enjoy the next one hour or so of True Scary Stories, and I will see you guys again at the end of the video. When I was in my junior year of college, it was recommended to me by one of my advisors and mentors to volunteer at a summer camp for young teens. The idea of a summer camp wasn't exactly my thing, but this was one of those gigs that would look really good on your resume for a potential employer, especially given my degree program. Before the end of the year, I researched the area around my hometown and found a camp only about an hour or so away. They were looking for some additional counselors, so I jumped right on the chance. After a phone interview with a man named Stan, I secured my position. This particular camp started right after the 4th of July and ran until the third week of August. During the duration, we would see several different iterations of campers. On July 5th, which was the day before camp started this year, I drove up to meet Stan and all the other fellow counselors. I wanted to get to know the rest of the staff and most importantly, become somewhat familiar with the grounds themselves which were quite large. I arrived at around 11 a.m. or so. Standing right outside of a big house was this tall, burly man. They were waving to me. To the left of the house was a parking lot, and the man was gesturing for me to pull over there. After I parked, I started approaching the man with my hand extended. We shook, and the man started laughing. He had a very jolly southern accent. Hey, we hug around here, friend. Name's Stan. You must be Cassie? Then he hugged me. Being hugged by a strange man would usually send me into an uproar, but this guy had a real sort of Santa Claus quality about him. It really made you feel at ease. I realized quickly whilst talking with him why all the kids loved him and why this camp had such glowing reviews. Stan was a tremendous human being and had a presence you just kind of wanted to be around. He gave me a map and personally escorted me around the grounds. When we arrived at the lake, his still ever cheerful voice said, I'm going to hand you over to my wife now. Got some formality things I need to get done, but I'm sure you'll love her. She'll take you to where all the girls bunk. I looked behind me and saw a beautiful older woman making her way to the lake. She smiled and waved and said hello and said she'd show me to where the girls slept, then show me where I'd be sleeping. She'd also introduce me to the other counselors as well. The entire walk with Paula was much like the walk with Stan. She was lovely and a joy to speak with. She showed me the cabins, showed me which cabin I would be solely responsible for since each counselor had one, and then we made our way to a huge wooden building. This was the recreation building, where all the campers would eat dinner and partake in camp activities. There, I met all the fellow counselors, and we all clicked right away. I was really excited about the weeks ahead. I figured, hey, this doesn't seem like the worst way to spend my summer. That night, I couldn't sleep at all. The counselors had their own cabin to sleep in. It was nicer than you might expect it to be. It was two of us in a room, and the rooms were spacious enough that there was plenty of privacy if you wanted. Since I couldn't sleep, I figured I might take a walk around the grounds for a bit. My roommate Ashley was sound asleep, and I made sure she didn't wake up when I left the room. Well, it didn't really feel like sneaking out, though, since Stan and Paula had told me numerous times the grounds were basically my home now and I could do whatever I liked when I was not with the children. They were even more beautiful at night, honestly. The number of stars in the sky was staggering compared to what I was used to. While I was walking around, I remembered a book I'd forgotten in my car. 
I figured I'd grab it and take it to my room to read until I was tired enough to fall asleep. On my way to the car, I passed by the big house I'd noticed when I first pulled in. It was a big white mansion, and the lights were on inside. I didn't mean to snoop, but as I walked by, I just so happened to glance up into the windows. I saw Stan and Paula talking to two men I didn't recognize. These two guys were definitely not staffers from the camp. I try not to judge people on appearance, but these guys were pretty clearly some shady folks. The demeanor of Stan and Paula was also quite different from earlier. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I saw that Stan appeared to be yelling at these guys. I honestly didn't think too much about it. Maybe it was just friends or even family. Wasn't really my business. I just carried on. I grabbed my book and started to walk back to my cabin. I passed by that white house again. I was about to keep walking. When I was about 30 yards away, someone shouted my name. I turned around, and Paula was practically chasing me. She asked me if I was looking in on them and invading their privacy. I was honest with her and told her I couldn't sleep. I'd gone for a walk and grabbed a book. She had a look on her face that I can't really say I know how to describe. It seemed like she didn't believe me. She said, okay, head back to your cabin right now. We got a big day tomorrow. I went back to the cabin and tried to read, but I was too distracted by that weird interaction. I thought about it for a while and eventually fell asleep. I woke up the next morning feeling great, even with the lack of sleep. The campers arrived and camp officially started. The week went on and I kind of forgot about my run-in with Paula. One night, about a week into camp though, I couldn't sleep yet again. It was around 2 in the morning. I was just laying there and jumped up because I thought I heard a noise. I went into the hall figuring it was one of the counselors going to the restroom, or maybe even coming back to the cabin after sneaking out. When I got to the landing of the stairs that overlooked the living room though, I noticed that all the lights were still off. In the dark living room though, I could see two figures, seemingly going through bags. There was enough light shining through the window from the outdoor sensor light that I could just about make them out. I didn't say anything at first. I figured these two people were probably counselors. I slowly started to creep down into the living room, and when I finally reached the bottom, a figure turned and looked at me. I recognized him right away. It was one of those two guys I'd seen on my first night walking by Stan. His eyes were wide, and his cheeks were completely sunken in. I felt paralyzed. Before I could say or do anything, they started to approach me. At the same time, the man reached for something in the back of his waistband. At that point, I was finally able to let out a scream. The other man grabbed him by the shoulder. We gotta go now, man. It's not worth it. The man never broke eye contact with me and moved backward until he stepped back through the door. They ran out into the night. Seconds later, a bunch of counselors ran out and saw me shaking at the base of the stairs. I was stumbling over my words, but eventually I was able to convey to them what just happened. One of the counselors called Stan, who came down in his four-wheeler right away. I explained to him what happened. Out loud in front of everyone, I said, It was those two guys I saw you talking with the first night. Stan looked confused and just sort of laughed in the same jolly voice he always had. Why, sweetie, I have no earthly idea what you're talking about. I don't remember talking to anybody that night, and unless they work on the camp, how are they supposed to get in? The back and forth continued for a while. Finally, Ashley grabbed me and pulled me away. She could see I was getting ready to lose it. Stan left eventually and told us he would be alerting the proper authorities that we had nothing to worry about. After he left, everybody who left their bags in the living room noticed their things had been stolen. As terrible as that is, thankfully not everybody had been robbed. The next day, I told Paula what happened and that a few people had been robbed. She looked right in my eyes and said, Whatever you think is going on, you're wrong. It was a terrible accident, 
and it will be taken care of. Well, I decided to leave right after that conversation. I hadn't signed any contracts or anything crazy like that. I felt it was well within my rights to just say goodbye. I marched over to Stan and basically told him I quit. He didn't stop me from leaving. I never pursued this any further and never really got any answers as to who those guys were, what they wanted, or what their relationship with Stan and Paula was. I just kind of left it alone. This is the first time I'm telling this story since my brief stay at that summer camp over 15 years ago. I just had a really bad feeling in my stomach that I would be meeting those intruders again if I stayed. I'm happy I never had to deal with summer camp ever again. This is something weird that happened to me a few years ago. I had just moved into a new house that I was renting. I was living all alone by myself in a two-bedroom home that had two levels. It was not that big, but was a good size for me. There was a small front yard and backyard as well, with a little patio. The neighborhood was pretty nice. There were a lot of other houses on it, but it wasn't too crowded either. After moving in, I had to get some furniture to fill in the space. I thought I would really enjoy living here overall. I worked a job about 10 minutes away and really liked the city itself too. Literally, the first night after I moved in though, something happened. I was upstairs laying in bed. It was around 11 o'clock or so. I was on my phone scrolling through things, waiting until I got really tired. Everything in the house was completely quiet, and all my lights were off as well. That's when I suddenly heard the sound of glass breaking coming from downstairs. I sat up, and my heart started pounding instantly. My very first thought was that somebody must be breaking in right now. However, after the initial glass shattering, I didn't hear anything else at all. I grabbed my phone up my nightstand and dialed 911. I explained what happened and stayed in my bedroom. I was going to wait until the police arrived. During that entire time that I was waiting, I didn't hear anything at all from downstairs. I had no clue if somebody was inside my house or not. When the police got there, they searched the home, and I finally left my bedroom. I talked with the officers, and they told me nobody was inside. They searched the entire property up and down, and no signs of anyone. My kitchen window in the back had been smashed, and the glass was everywhere. I was told that it had likely been broken with a blunt object. It seemed, though, that whoever broke the window only broke it and then left immediately. Well, that was obviously strange to me, but I was glad they didn't try to do anything more. They hadn't even tried to enter my house at all, it seemed. The next day, I got the window replaced. I got it done as fast as I could. I was paranoid that whoever had done this would return and try to break in again or something. I got a much stronger window to replace the old one. The next night, everything was perfectly fine. It took me a long time to fall asleep, but when I did, I was not aware of the person returning to my property. The next day, everything was fine as well. Now I was very curious, though. Why would somebody smash my window in the middle of the night like that and just leave immediately? A few days later, I was in my living room. It was pretty late at night, and my living room was at the front side of the home. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I heard a loud bang coming from somewhere in the back. It was coming from outside the kitchen area of my home. I couldn't believe this was happening again. Several seconds later, I heard another noise. I actually decided to go over and investigate this time. I walked around the corner just to look toward the back window and see what was going on. I was still a good distance away but to my surprise, I could see what looked like a woman rushing away from my back patio. They moved over to the side of my house. I ran back over to the living room and called the police again. 
Thankfully, my window hadn't been broken there. She just seemed to break the same window that was broken before. As I was dialing 911, the woman came to my front doorstep and started banging on my front door with whatever she had in her hands. I didn't answer. I told the police what was happening, and they said someone would be there shortly. Afterwards, I moved toward the kitchen and away from the front door, where the woman still was. I never really got a good look at her at all, so I couldn't describe her very well. She remained at the front door and continued to pound on it on and off. Luckily, she didn't try to smash any more windows, though. The police arrived eventually, and the woman was still there. They ended up questioning her, and she admitted to being the one who smashed my window. It was unclear as to why she had done it, though. I found out she lived just down the street from me, and was actually a neighbor of mine. That was really crazy. After that incident, I never actually saw her again, though. I only lived in that house for one year before moving to another city, so I'm not really sure what her problem with me was. A few months ago, I got a new apartment. I moved into what I would describe as a pretty average apartment building. There are four floors, each floor with a couple of hallways filled with various apartment units. I moved in after the lease at my old place was up. This was certainly a step up from my old apartment. This one had several open units and I took basically the first one that I saw. It was the second to the last unit, at the very end of a hallway on the second floor. It had one bedroom and a bathroom. When I moved in, I really liked it quite a lot. On one of the first nights that I was living there after I moved in, I was in my living room when I started to hear very loud music coming from the next apartment over, the one at the very end of the hallway. Normally, I wouldn't really mind that much, but it was so loud that it was shaking the damn walls. I couldn't even really hear specifically what songs were playing or anything. It was just super loud. I thought maybe my neighbor was just practicing guitar or something. I didn't feel like it would last for very long, but it certainly did. It continued for hours until well past midnight. I was trying to go to sleep. My bedroom wall was right up against their apartment, and with all that noise, I obviously could not do so. I really didn't want to have to do this, but I decided to go over and knock on their door. Surely they had to be reasonable and understand they were making a huge ruckus. I left my apartment and walked over to it. I knocked on the door loud enough for the person to hear, but of course they didn't answer. I stayed there for a few minutes and then knocked again once more. Still, nobody answered. I was there for at least five minutes altogether and realized they were not going to talk to me. By now, I was pretty damn angry at whoever it was that lived there. I went to my apartment, wrote them a note, and left it on the door. I told them their music was too loud and I couldn't sleep at all. They shouldn't do things like that so late at night. The music kept going, and eventually, after putting some soundproof headphones on and laying in bed for another hour, I finally fell asleep. After work the next day, I got home to my place. I was having a fairly normal evening. I had almost forgotten about the whole situation the previous night. At around 8 or 9 p.m., though, there was a sudden extremely loud bang at my front door, followed by several more slightly quieter ones. It was like somebody had knocked on my apartment door as loud as they could. When I went to my door, I looked out the peephole to see nobody there. However, I did hear a door closing not far away. I opened up my door to find a note on it. It was the same note I had written my neighbor next door but on the blank side of it that I hadn't written anything on. There were large letters. It said, fuck you. Now this really made me angry. I wanted to go over and fight whoever this person was. 
I took a minute or two to cool down, though, and realized I didn't want to get involved in a war with my new next-door neighbor. After all, I had just moved in there. I decided to try and take a kinder approach. First, I wrote another note apologizing about being angry about the noise. I said a few other nice things as well, and I wanted to see what would happen as a result. Probably nothing, or maybe it would get stuffed back in my door. If that was the case and the ruckus continued, then I would have to think of something else. After I wrote the note, I taped it to my neighbor's door. For the rest of the night, everything was fine. I didn't hear any loud music, no bangs on my door, nothing. The next morning, as I was leaving for work, I opened my front door to find a note placed on it. I picked it up and read it. I'm sorry for the confusion. Why don't you come over tonight at around 9 or so? It felt like maybe we were not on such bad terms anymore. Maybe they wanted to have a conversation with me and we could talk things out. I still had no idea who lived there or what they looked like or anything. That night at around 9 p.m., I left my apartment and went over to next door. When I got to the apartment on the end, just feet away, I saw the door was already cracked open a little. I knocked on it and as I opened it up a little farther inside the apartment, I could see it was pitch black. Not a single light was on inside. I didn't really know what to make of this. I heard a man's voice coming from seemingly deep inside. He called out, telling me to come in. I pushed the door open a little bit more. I couldn't really see anything though. I also noticed there was really creepy music playing in the background of the apartment. It sounded like something you would see in a horror movie or something. I didn't want to go in any further. I left the apartment and walked back to mine. Whoever that guy was seemed to be really strange. Maybe it was his idea of a joke or something, but there was no way I was going in there on my own. I contacted the management of my apartment complex and explained the whole situation to them. I ended up switching apartments and moving to an open unit on the fourth floor. It was literally the next day. It was also on the other side of the building. I moved all of my stuff immediately. I'm not sure how they handled the situation with that creepy guy, but I currently still live in the same building. I've never gone near where that guy's unit was ever since, and I have no clue if he still lives there or not. I'm just glad I was able to get away from him. This is a really cool and borderline disturbing story that happened to my friends and I a couple of years ago. We all live in Nevada, but every fall we fly to New York to hike some of the trails, specifically in the Adirac Mountain area. If none of you have ever seen autumn in New York, it's very worth it. The sights are beautiful. Breathtaking really is the only word that comes to mind. I know a lot of people where we live think of New York City every time we say we're going to New York. They don't realize that the state itself is very big. Most of it is actually mountains and forest land. Basically, what I'm saying is do yourself a favor and check it out, especially if you're a big fan of nature and the outdoors. My friend Luis always makes the plans for us every year. He's one of those strange types of people who could really just live off the land, be stranded in the elements, and survive relatively easily. We trust Luis completely. He's safe, he's thorough, he's never led us into danger yet, and we've been doing these hikes and camping trips for over a decade now. This year was no different really. We got to our cabin and spent the first night going over the map and trail that Luis had planned out. Seemed like a fairly straightforward trip, honestly. Sometimes Luis would like to really challenge us. This year, though, he just wanted to enjoy the sights and not worry about the difficulty of terrain or things like that. We started early in the morning. We were navigating the woods, taking pictures of all the amazing sights. During our hike, Luis took us a little off course. He said he could see something a little strange looking up ahead that didn't look natural. 
I've seen enough horror movies to know that when someone says they see something like that, it's usually no bueno. A few yards off the course of the trail, we stumbled upon a very old-looking structure. It became clear right away this was supposed to be some sort of old church. I can confidently say that because the building had a big steeple and a cross on top. If you ask me, that's a dead giveaway. Even though we were surrounded by beautiful sights, this was somehow the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. We were deep into the woods, and not in the areas that people hike typically. The fact that a building like this was out here, and in the condition that it was, was truly amazing. After a bunch of pictures, we went inside the church. I'm doubling down by saying this was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my own eyes. It was like stepping into a time machine. There were several wooden benches inside that led to a wooden altar at the back of the church. I remember a giant wooden cross. There were candles everywhere as well. Now, obviously the candles had long since burned down to nothing. All that really was there was wax all over the floorboards. In between one of the benches was a Bible so old that you couldn't even see a single word on it anymore. To this day, I actually still have that Bible on my bookshelf. It's an awesome conversation starter that obviously leads to this story. We hung around inside the church for a while, just sort of taking in the awe of the situation. We talked about possible conclusions for who might have used this, but every answer we came up with made no sense really. And that's mainly because there wasn't anything else near this church, at least nothing we could find. No buildings, not even the remnants of a building. While we were hanging around this church, Luis noticed something else weird behind the altar. There were a couple of floorboards that, while walking around, sounded different than the other ones. Luis moved the wooden altar out of the way to reveal two hinges. This amazing discovery of ours was about to get even cooler. Not only did we find a church in the middle of nowhere, but now we'd found a weird trap door in the floor. We shined our flashlights down into the hole, but it just looked like a dark and dusty hole in the earth. We could see the dirty ground. I would guess it was at most eight feet down or so. I got on my stomach and was practically hanging down into the hole. I wasn't sure, but I thought I could see paintings or something on the wall. Without giving my friends any chance to decide, I jumped down inside. I told them I wanted to check it out, and what a sight it was to behold. While I was down there, I could see there were indeed paintings all over the walls. The walls appeared to be made of stone, but I'm not exactly an expert on architecture. The paintings were nothing of note, really. There were symbols and weird things that I don't even really know how to describe. Nothing really offensive, really, though. I'm sure it was some sort of religious symbology, but I'm not religious, so I have no idea what they would be. While I was mesmerized by these weird symbols, my eyes were eventually directed to the back of the dark square room I was in. There was a small boarded up hole in the wall. It was an intentionally boarded hole, with wooden planks and nails struck into it. I was shouting to my friends what I was seeing. As I was doing this, I told them I was going to break the boards down and see what was in there. I could hear Luis screaming at me to stop from up above, but I just ignored him. I ripped the planks down and shined my light into the hole. It was as dark inside as could be. The weirdest part was a small heat radiating from inside. A legit warmth. It was a little too tight for me to go into, so unfortunately I did not get to look any further. Our lights were pretty powerful too so the fact that my shining in there just revealed the continuing darkness really amazed me. Once my friends pulled me back up, they each took turns inspecting that hole in the wall. We really felt like explorers. This was the first time in all the years we'd gone hiking that I ever felt an emotion like this. We eventually decided to finish up our hike. When we got back to the cabin, Luis informed park rangers about the church. We informed them about everything we found, really. 
The rangers said we went way off course, even though Luis disagreed with them. The ranger told Luis the hole supposedly led to some collapsed mine from a long time ago. He said the hole in the wall eventually got tighter if you tried to crawl through it, and you would get stuck inside. It became too much of a hazard, and that's why it was blocked off. We tried doing some more research about the area. We found some info, but nothing that gave us direct answers. There did used to be many mines in the area, so it does make sense. Either way, that was one of the coolest and creepiest things I'd ever seen. The more we thought about it, the more unnerving the story became, though. What if people were down there when it all collapsed? And why did this old church in the woods even have a path into a mine anyway? There's just so many questions. What do you guys think? Do you think it was really some sort of mine entrance? Or something else entirely? Almost a year to the day of me writing this, I experienced one of the worst and most traumatic experiences of my entire life. Please bear with me as I try to tell this story as best I can. My best friend and I decided to go on a hike one day. I was in high school at the time, I believe. The weather was not ideal. It was raining and cold. Personally, though, I loved the rain mixed with the beautiful autumn trees. I was all in. It was also a Tuesday afternoon. We figured everyone would be working on a Tuesday. We found a trail that really interested us. We made the 40-minute drive, and when we arrived, we instantly got excited. There wasn't one single car parked there. We knew it was going to be slow due to the weather and the weekday status, but we didn't expect it to be this empty. The idea of having the entire forested area all to ourselves was really an awesome one. We were pumped up beyond belief. A few minutes into our hike, my friend noticed something weird, though. I didn't notice anything, but he was looking through the trees like he'd seen a person or something. I asked him what was wrong. He pointed to roughly 20 feet away. He said, Hey, you see that right there? Tell me that doesn't look like a person, like a face staring right at us. After a few seconds, I did see what he was talking about. It was weird. It did look like a person, but it also sort of didn't. It's hard to explain. We kept walking on the trail because whatever this weird face was that we saw, it was not moving or blinking at all. I told him it was most likely some sort of optical illusion. You know, sometimes nature's weird like that. As we got closer to the face, though, it became quite clear what it actually was. It appeared to be some sort of mask that had been nailed directly to a tree. It wasn't on the path either. If you hadn't noticed it back when he did, you would have never seen it at all probably. It blended in perfectly with the trees. It was surrounded by branches as well, with a few remaining leaves covering it up as if someone had tried to hide it. We went over and examined it. It was just so strange. It was one of those cheap plastic masks you can buy from anywhere. We took a picture of it because it seemed cool and out of place. My friend wanted to take the mask down, but I told him not to, just in case it was from some kind of Halloween event the park was doing or something. He didn't care though, he pulled it down anyway. Inside the mask, he actually found a note. We decided to read it, and it said this. Number one. Go behind this tree and continue walking until you find number two. Now this really convinced me this must have been an event for the park of some sort. My friend didn't really think so though. He made a good point. This tree was already off the path. They wouldn't want children to wander even further into the woods. I suggested leaving and continuing on with our hike. It was really starting to downpour now. My friend, though, wanted to see if there really was something at the location this mask described. Without listening to me, he followed the directions and continued walking behind the tree. 
It wasn't close, but we did eventually find something. Maybe 50 or 60 feet into a thick forested area, we found another mask. This time, it was barely visible, practically buried into the dirt. He lifted the mask up after a bit of digging, and sure enough, there was another strange note inside. I'll just save time and tell you this pattern continued for three more clues, a total of five masks in total. When we arrived at the very last one, all the note inside said was, See you soon. It gave us chills. We sort of laughed it off at the time, though. I thought it was just because of the weird situation, but I was sure I could hear noises echoing all around us. I thought I was just being paranoid, so I ignored my gut and continued the hike with my friend. A few hours later, we made it back to the car and were surprised to see another vehicle in the lot now. It was parked right next to me, way too close for comfort. I might add, it was so close that I actually had to move the car so my friend could open the door and get in. We talked about the masks on the way home, and we came to the conclusion it must be some sort of elaborate prank or something. Maybe it really was an event. Given the time of year, it was also not unlikely to think someone might be trying to just scare someone. You know how people could be. I dropped him off at his house and went home for the rest of the night. In just a few hours, my worst night ever was about to begin, though. I finished watching a football game I had recorded and was starting to get ready to go to bed. It was close to 11 p.m. or so if I had to guess. I should also say I lived alone at the time of the story. While I was in the bathroom, I thought I could hear something outside. Ordinarily, I would just write it off immediately, but for some reason, I felt the need to look an urgent and desperate need. I still can't believe what I saw. There were five people standing on my front lawn and wearing masks. They were the same type of mask from the hike earlier in the day. After I saw them, I ran upstairs to my bedroom and phoned the police right away. The entire time I was waiting, I continued watching from my bedroom window. That was the longest ten minutes of my entire life. The people outside were behaving strangely to say the very least. They were doing some sort of dance. It was almost like they were celebrating for some reason. Every minute or so, they would pause their dancing and run to the front door, ringing the doorbell and banging on it many times. Then they would run back to the center of the front yard and continue doing their strange ritualistic dance. Part of me was still telling myself this was some elaborate prank, but if it was, in my opinion, it had gone on for far too long. The last few minutes before the police arrived, they started to get bolder. Instead of just ringing the doorbell and banging on the door, they started to slam it with their entire bodies. The front door was directly below my room, so I could feel the vibration each time they slammed into the door. Finally, ten minutes after I called, I saw lights from the cop cars in the distance. When the mass of people saw them coming, I saw them scatter. Two cops attempted to chase them at that moment, but they came back only a minute or two later. I talked to the officers and gave them my statement, but nothing really came from it. The police never caught or arrested anyone, and since I didn't have any proof and there were no signs of forced entry... The police basically told me they couldn't do anything. I would need to just call if they ever came back. I wasn't satisfied, but what could I do? The next day, I bought a ring camera, and one year later, the masked men still have yet to come back. I'd been able to convince myself that it was just some prank, and that's the only reason why I'm still able to sleep at night. Truthfully, I have no idea if it was a prank or not. Maybe these folks really intended to hurt me. Judging by the force of their bodies hitting the door, it's quite hard to know for sure. I just hope they never come after me again. I'm a 19-year-old male, currently about to finish my first year at Rice University. 
Until just recently, my father served in the United States Army, and as such, our family had to move around quite a lot. When they reached my teens, my mother got tired of shuffling from base to base. We set down roots for the first time. My dad was deployed for much of this time, and I only saw him here and there. Mom and I found a small two-bedroom home in Virginia and got a little mutt from the pound as well. I was finally able to live like a regular kid and make friends whose parents weren't also soldiers. Our neighbors were very friendly and often had neighborhood cookouts on summer holidays. I remember I kissed my first girl at a July 4th party and met my best friend on my first day of school as well. It was the life I'd always dreamed of, and although it was a relatively short time comparatively, I enjoyed every minute. Despite all the things my mother had done wrong in my life, that one decision made up for almost all of it. I bring up my rocky relationship with my mother, only to lead to the point of this story. We'd been living in the house a year or so, when I noticed a man and young boy had begun walking by every single day. This went on for over a month or so, before I brought it up with my mother. And I was honestly just curious if she knew anything about the pair. Rather than say no, she gave me a lengthy speech about minding my own business. I kept my mouth shut after that, even when we'd see the two around town. I wouldn't say anything. My mom tried bringing them up once, but when I failed to take the bait, she never mentioned them again either. Usually, whenever we saw them, they were standing around the same busy intersection, seemingly begging for money. The man held a sign that said, Disabled vet can't work. Me and son need your help. Any donations accepted? The man would stand by a signal pole, while the boy went from car to car with a coffee can. I felt bad at first, but I soon discovered the truth. It was a wet fall evening when my mom and I were leaving the Walmart. The lot was so full when we arrived that we had to park around the back of the store. I was helping load bags into the back seat when I noticed the man and boy run up to an almost new Dodge truck and get inside. I did a double take just to make sure. It seems strange they were begging for change during the day, but driving such a nice car later, it was nicer than my own family's. Had I realized that there may have been some circumstances I wasn't aware of and boy were there, something rubbed it about me the wrong way. As time went by, I'd see the pair all around town, but only saw that truck twice. The second time was where the story began to get scary. This occurred a few months later, when my mom was working overnight like always. She told me to stay home and not open the door for anyone. Like most teenagers, I ignored her and did whatever I wanted, really. On this night, I was skating with a few friends at a drive through bank. It was around midnight when a familiar truck pulled up nearby. The man inside asked if we wanted to go to a party. It was supposedly the boy's birthday, and he wanted some kids his age to celebrate with. Everyone declined the offer, even after he mentioned there would be party favors available. They offered once more before driving off. Thinking about that situation seemed quite strange, and I was not the only one who felt it. Only later on would I truly discover just how wise our choice had been. 2019 soon became 2020, and with the new year, as you can remember, some crazy stuff happened. I continued to see the two people walking down my street and begging at the intersection, until one day they just suddenly disappeared. I took note of it, but figured they must have moved on just as my family had done many other times before. It was a lifestyle I was very familiar with. Lockdown came soon, and my focus shifted onto other things. It wasn't until well after the lockdowns had ended that the two strangers came back to my mind. I was browsing through Twitter, 
when I saw a picture of a man connected to a headline. I clicked on the link and got the shock of my life. According to the article, the young man, whose name was withheld because he was a minor, had showed up at our local police station and shared quite the disturbing story. At first, the officers didn't believe him, but after a bit of research, they were eager to hear more. It turned out a few years prior to their arrival to our town, the man of the pair had grabbed the young man from a bus station in St. Louis. Over the course of several months, the man abused the boy until he grew tired of him. Rather than dispose of him, though, he used the young boy to lure other young men into his trap. The pair would travel from city to city, begging during the day and trolling for prey at night. The boy estimated the man had violated roughly 25 to 30 other boys during his time traveling with him. He was adamant that he never took part in any of the actual acts. His purpose was solely to make the young men get into the truck, and although many of the men were released alive, the boy said he was positive a few were not so lucky. In one case, the boy said the man was covered in blood after dumping a young man off the side of the highway. When he asked about the blood, the man threatened to kill him, so he didn't press the matter any further. Unfortunately, without witnessing any of this firsthand, he couldn't provide any names or locations. Their dark way of life carried on until mid-2020, when the old man contracted COVID and died. With nowhere to go, the boy figured that he'd just tell his story, in hopes that someone may help him find his family. At the time the story was written, the investigation was still in its early phases. I'm not sure how much more has been discovered since then. If I find out anything more during summer break, I'll post an update of everything. Needless to say, that article really put me into a state of shock for many days after I read it. I had been suspicious of the two from the very start, but realizing how close I had been to possibly being killed was just too much to handle. I briefly thought about sharing the story with my mother, but quickly changed my mind, considering her behavior from the outset. It didn't seem smart. As far as I'm aware, she doesn't know anything about it still. It wouldn't be out of the ordinary for her to miss something so major. She's always been focused on herself to the cost of everyone around her. Really, that's all I know for now. There was no information about what became of the boy. He'd probably be an adult by now. For all I know, he could be a fellow student at my school. Maybe even yours. Maybe there's a chance he took up his companion's habits too. They say those who are hurt often hurt others. If anyone reading this has a young teen son... It might be a good idea to share this story with them. They could save their innocence, and maybe even more importantly, their life one day. For a long time, my family and I have made a difference in my small community. My grandpa opened and owned his own car repair shop which he passed on to my father. He ran the shop for 50 years, and now at 35 years old, my father handed me the keys to run it. I love cars, and being able to solve the issues that come up with them. Honestly, what I enjoy the most is being able to help the people in the area, though. I don't know this for a fact, but judging by the stories I see online... It seems like a lot of mechanics out there try and take advantage of their clients, skim a few extra bucks off the top. But that's not me. Most of my customers are locals that live in the area or nearby. Often, we get customers from nearby areas coming in just because of our sterling reputation. In a time where many people are struggling financially, it benefits to save a few bucks here or there. Occasionally, we'll also get a customer who's traveling through. My hometown isn't far off an exit that pretty much is in the middle of nowhere if I'm being honest. At least a couple of times a month, we'll get someone on a cross-country trip or something like that that ends up having a flat tire or engine trouble. 
I would say 99.99% of the time, these folks are very friendly and go about their business when finished. On rare occasion, though, we'll get someone who's just horrible. Several months ago, I had the worst customer in all my time doing this job. This customer wasn't just bad. She was borderline evil, in fact. The day started just like any other day, slow for the most part, other than a single oil change. Around noon or so, a very beautiful woman came strolling in. She was driving a white Volkswagen, and I knew right away she must be from out of town. People in my town just didn't look like this woman. I don't mean that as an insult to the woman or the people of my town. More the way she was dressed up, the sort of makeup she had on, even the way she talked, it was nothing like the people here. If that wasn't enough of a dead giveaway, the Vermont license plate certainly was, considering it was more than a day's drive away. The woman jumped out of her car and started claiming she needed it fixed right away. I wasn't a big fan of how she was acting, but business was slow. I let her continue, as she aggressively tried to explain the issue. She seemed very confused and stuttered over her words quite a lot. She claimed that while she was driving, the engine started to get really loud, and if she took the car over 50 miles per hour, it would start to shake. In an arrogant tone that still bothers me just thinking about it, she said, You'll fix this car right now, like she was trying to use a Jedi mind trick on me or something. It took everything I had not to turn her away. Against my better judgment, I took the car in and told her she'd need to wait for a while. I would try to find the problem and let her know what she was dealing with. Not long after, I found the issue, and let's just say it was not going to be an easy fix. I informed her that I couldn't finish the job today, but I'd have it ready by midday tomorrow. She really caused a scene and stormed out of the shop, didn't inquire about hotels, transportation, food, or anything else. She just stormed right out of there, leaving me with her car. I assumed she must want me to fix it, so I started working on the vehicle immediately. I didn't want to deal with her personally. Since I didn't want to deal with her, I decided to work late and finish the job that night, hoping to get rid of her early the next morning. I anticipated she would arrive early, looking to figure out what was going on. I completed the job at around 10 p.m. and felt pretty exhausted. I began cleaning up the shop and preparing to leave. It was nearly 11 p.m. when I was finally ready to turn off the lights and head home. As I grabbed my coat, I thought I could hear a sound coming from the garage. It resembled a tool hitting the ground. Since I'm meticulous about my tools and always put them away, I wanted to make sure I returned anything that fell before leaving. I went back into the garage and upon turning on the light, I noticed two wrenches on the ground. I was very confused. I hadn't used those tools at all that day. I couldn't understand how they'd just fallen into the middle of the floor. How would they even get there? Feeling annoyed, I picked them up. As I was putting away the last wrench, though, I heard a scream coming from the counter. I turned around, only to see the exact same woman from earlier, charging toward me with a wrench in hand. She swung it at me, but thankfully I was able to raise my arms just in time to protect my head. Don't get me wrong, it hurt really bad, but thankfully it wasn't a direct crack to my noggin. She struck me again and again. At that point, I was on the ground in a defensive position, trying to shield my skull while she kept blowing into me. She dealt one final hit to my ribs. It was excruciatingly painful. I heard the wrench hit the ground, and a few seconds later, her car started. She sped out of my parking lot. It took a huge effort for me, but I managed to get back to my feet. First, I called my wife. Then, I called the police. I should have called the police immediately, but honestly, I was relieved to simply be alive still, and that the ordeal was over now. I wasn't thinking rationally at that moment. Unfortunately, I didn't recall her full license plate number. 
The only camera in the shop also didn't capture it or provide a clear view of the woman. Therefore, all I could provide the police was a description of her and the make and model of her car. What's most terrifying to me, though, is that she had no reason to attack me at all. She was trying to bash my head in as if she was aiming to kill me. If I hadn't brought my arms to protect myself in time, she would have done so. It's frightening to think she may have been hiding around my shop that entire day. When I finished working on a car, I'd hang the keys behind the register. The woman must have snuck in unnoticed by me and taken the keys while I was closing up, waiting for the moment I was most vulnerable to launch her attack. If anyone out there spots a white Volkswagen Jetta and encounters a beautiful blonde woman from out of town, exercise caution. She might be the exact same insane person who tried to take my life for no reason. It all began one day when I was about 13 years old. It was after school, I believe. I was walking home with a friend of mine, and for what seemed like no reason whatsoever, a small blue car decided to honk its horn at us several times as it passed us by. We didn't recognize the driver in the slightest, but put it down to her thinking she knew us. We didn't really think much of it at the time, this soon became an everyday thing after school, but the encounters just got stranger and stranger. Eventually, we began to recognize the car and number plate from afar and mentally prepare for whatever bizarre thing was about to happen. A car beeping at two children every day is strange enough, but the worst part was the woman driving. She was pale and had short cropped hair, and wore these bizarre-looking shirts. Something about the way she looked at us was just really unsettling. She'd slow down just enough for us to see her face, and she'd start laughing at us with the creepiest smile. Sometimes she'd wave in a mocking way. Sometimes she'd have a child in the back of the car who would join in and laugh or wave as well we began to consider that maybe she was legitimately planning or timing these passes by. We decided to either mix up our routes home and take an alternative route, leave the school quickly to avoid her, or wait longer before setting off her home after school. No matter what we did though, she'd always pass us by each day. This sort of confirmed to us that she was driving around the area until she came across us. I don't remember when this stopped, but eventually my dad retired and offered to drop me off and pick me up from school. It was probably around that time. I told my parents and of course they were furious at the fact some creepy woman was harassing my friend and I. I believe they informed the school as well. Genuinely, to this very day, I remember her full number plate and exactly how she looked. It still creeps me out thinking about her, and the older I become, the weirder the whole thing seems. Fast forward a couple of years now. I was in a coffee shop in my town center with my parents one weekend, when all of a sudden I felt very uneasy. I looked all around me and saw the same woman watching me from across the shop, I immediately panicked and told my parents. My dad got ready to confront her. Soon after we'd spotted her though, she got up and fled. I got up too with my mom and we stood by the door. I felt like I needed to see where she'd go. Somehow she knew I was there though. As she walked away, she turned and gave me that same mocking smile. Skip a couple of years again now. I'm 17 and working in a coffee shop part-time. It was the same chain as the one I'd seen her in a couple years before, but in a different area. My parents would often pop in during my shifts and have a coffee to cheer me up, as they knew I didn't particularly enjoy the job. On this day, they were sitting having a coffee with a couple of their friends, when out of nowhere walks the very same woman... I left to the back of the shop and told my manager about her. Luckily, they were very understanding 
and went to check it out. He came back and told me the woman had left. He said she actually came in quite often, with a different man most visits. Luckily, that day, she ordered a coffee to go, and I didn't see her again. My parents had also recognized her and told the story of how creepy she was to the friends they were with. The friends informed my parents that they actually knew who she was. Very strange character, often made bizarre and creepy comments toward them, always seemed to be with a different partner or husband after the previous one died. Over the next few years, I left my job in the coffee shop and started working elsewhere full time. My parents still regularly meet up with their friends. It wasn't long ago that they came home and told me that the creepy woman had apparently passed away. She'd suddenly collapsed and died out of nowhere. Apparently, a lot of people who encountered her believed there was something very off with her character. To this day, I've never really felt the sense of dread like I had each time I encountered this woman as a child. It's like I always knew something wasn't right about her, but I guess I'll never know now. I genuinely believe she had an obsession with wanting to freak me out for some reason and would physically go out of her way to do so. Strangely enough, I learned she never had children. It left me wondering, who is that small child who we'd often see in the car with her? What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.